conversations. I know. <laughs> I think that Bedeck is, in fact, a, at least from where I sit, a quadruple threat. <laughs> he was during my years at Wake Forest, and came a bit later, so mid to the latter 80s. He was widely seen on Wake Forest stages and in the pages of the Old Golden Black. His cartoons were an absolute joy to look forward to virtually every issue. I'm not sure if Steve knows this, uh, or he's taken conduct over the years. I'm not sure if he knows that my commencement speaker, so good, and he was here, I should say, as a graduate student in the theater department. Um, so my commencement year, 1986, the speaker was Gary Trudeau. And I, in some geeky student way, got to do the green room thing uh, beforehand. And I gave him a couple of Steve's cartoons. It's closing wonderful, I will always remember and still have a mentor here of uh, us graduates personified in a single figure leaping into the future. I saw Trudeau about five years later. I mean, he came to his alma mater where I was then for grad school. And I brought up, I remember that piece of it. So, lovely little, uh, you know, cartoons to cartoons. Second, I'm doing these, I guess, chronologically, he is a double wake parent, some of you may know, um, the magnificent Emily and Alex Nedvedek, both of whom also Graced to Wake Forest stages, clearly under the direction of Cindy, at least one case that I know of. So, a neat additional feature. And then for those of you who also venture on occasion to Chick fil A, uh, <laughs> for a while, for political reasons, I did not. But um, A, they are lots of refugees, and that's work my wife does and loves. And B, they have a contained playground space, and I have a six year old. Yeah. So, I guess for the last five and three, four years, I've gone to Chick fil A. Dads and daughters, um, kind of arrangement. And I have seen over that time some of the intriguing innovations that Chick fil A. You go every week, you notice that. Um, you may not know this about Steve. I know some of you know him in different guises, but um, he was the director, the Seaburn director of probably among the most innovative corporate labs, innovation labs I'm in the country. Secret location, that would be the boss. He was outside Atlanta. He worked with big phone pieces to reinvent the way one experienced Chick fil A, including my own kids. So um, I owe that to this remarkable fellow as well. And lastly, um, he has kept me up night after night of late with his Jekyll Island Chronicles. Um, I grabbed up both copies at once um, and have had such an extraordinary time with this uh, powerful story came from the mind of this creative fellow. So, I give to you for what I know will be a delightful hour or so of conversation. Steve Nedvedek, let me say, Nedvedek, let me say one last thing too, though, that he is going to be back on a Wake Forest stage in the not so distant future to play, play the governor in Cindy Gedrick's own production of Wake Forest's um, return to the great Bert Holbrecht play Caucasian Chalk Circle. So we'll hear from him now. You can hear him as a governor in just a few weeks. <laughs> Steve. You are always very kind, <laughs> and I appreciate that. And um, what he said is true, so that's a great thing to know about Rogan. Yeah, the good half is true. Yeah, fine. That's fine. Thank you, Erica. Um, and thank you, Cindy, for the opportunity that's coming up soon to, to say four lines. <laughs> they are precious, precious four lines. Precious four lines. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Am I, am I too hot on the, uh, on the mic? We good? You gonna, you got it. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, see some students in here. Good. I'll remember. <laughs> I'll remember. I want to spend a little bit of time with you. Just um, first of all, thanks for for being here, and being a part. And thanks to Megan for putting this together and really, you know, I mean, getting us, getting us this opportunity to talk about this thing called the Jekyll Island Chronicles. Um, but first, a little little setup about me, very very quickly, and it hopefully will set up more about why I kind of do what I do, and why I am the way that I am. Um, so yeah, so this is me. Um, we're gonna start early here. Uh, that's that's I can still do that too. I can still sit that way. I don't understand. It's a genetic thing. I'm adopted. I have no idea where that came, comes from. But um, my sister, uh, this, my sister and I, and I have a younger sister as well. We grew up in Detroit, and um, 
just you know, working class parents, neither mom nor dad graduated from high school. They went straight to work. And uh, we lived in little tiny track houses outside Detroit. My sister, Kathy, still lives in Winston-Salem. She lived in Winston since the mid-70s. She's raised a family here. I went, she works for Aon over at the big Reynolds building. And I had lunch with her today in like food trucks. And <laughs> it's so great to be back in Winston and to be at a place where I truly feel like it's, it's my second home. I, mean, I have Atlanta, and then I have Winston, and then there's everything else. Um, but this is, this is me kind of growing up and realizing that I was kind of artistic. My dad worked in a factory all day, but at night he would come home and he would paint portraits for friends and relatives. So that was his second job. Well, that was his third job. He worked delivering pizzas for Little Caesars to get extra money, and then he painted portraits. So that was his third job. And I just used to watch him, and I was fascinated. And so as a young person, I started to be gravitating toward art. I wonder why. And gravitating toward these people, which are right there. Yeah, so we moved to North Carolina when I was about nine years old. We went from Detroit, Michigan to Whiteville, North Carolina, which was in essence Mayberry, which is a reference that not many of my students would get. Sorry, so I get it. I asked him yesterday who David Bowie was. Not a single hand went up. I'm just telling you. I've just. <laughs> she she knows and Jerry, um, but the point of it is is there was not a lot to do in Tobacco Town, North Carolina, except read comic books and make backyard movies and read Mad Magazine. And that's what I grew up on, and that's just kind of what fed me. Uh, Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, you know, The Vision, The Avengers, that's what I was into. And so I started to draw in earnest, and this is the kind of thing that, you know, would pop out of my pen from time to time. Um, this, of course, was much later when I had developed a style. <laughs> but, um, you know, when you're, when you're young and you're, you're drawing and you're just trying things, and, oh, and by the way, you're short and you're fat and you can't play athletics, <laughs> you, you look for other scenes, you look for other ways to go. So for me, it was art and it was always art and it was theater. And my dad and I built the sets in our community theater together. And my very first production was in Oliver and I was the Artful Dodger. And it was life-changing and transformational. Um, another thing that was life-changing for me was this, which was going to work at Chick-fil-A when I was about 20 years old. I was an undergraduate at Wingate College, now Wingate University, and I worked at Monroe Mall Chick-fil-A, circa 1981, 1982. Yeah, graduated my degree, went into radio, TV, and still did arts on, art on the side. But um, one of my professors from Wingate actually went to school at Wake Forest. And he came to me one day and he said, would you be interested in getting your master's of theater? Now this was when Wake had a master's program in theater under Harold Tedford and the late great Don Wolf. May he rest in peace. And I said, sure, it sounds expensive. And you know, knowing I'm blue collar, and, you know, knowing what Wake Forest was, because my sister lived in Winston-Salem, we would drive by and just look and wave every single time we came into Winston off Silas Creek. And um, he said, would you do it if it were free? And I said, okay, I'm still listening. So I got a full assistantship to Wake Forest. Never thought I would, never planned on that. But next thing I knew, I'm on stage, in the main stage. This is Inherit the Wind, Don Wolf's production, 1986. I'm the one on the, that side, on the left, right, okay. I, for, it took me the longest time to figure out stage left, stage right. After I left the theater, you know, it's like, wait a minute, I don't know what, so uh, this was Inherit the Wind. I think they still have that tie. I looked for it in the costume shop today. So it was, it was theater. I love theater. I love the arts, and I love 
Chick-fil-A. And then an interesting thing happened on a trip to England to study theater for 16 days. I sat next to this lovely undergraduate. She was a senior. I was a second year graduate student. And uh, by the way, these are, that's, that's not like <laughs> stray hairs on my chin. <laughs> Don't know what that is. Uh, Sue Hardgrave. I sat next to her on the airplane going to London. I'd never met her before. 51 weeks later, we were married. Um, we lived for a while in Greensboro. And then I had an opportunity to go work for Chick-fil-A full time in Atlanta, making films and videos, working with actors, designing sets, all the stuff that I love to do. So we, we left um, North Carolina, went to Atlanta, and had these three fine young people. <laughs> My son Alex would hate it that I'm showing this picture right now. <laughs> the kid is like a 6'5 Adonis, and here he was not, clearly. <laughs> My daughter Emily calls this her awkward years. My son Michael now has no hair because it all fell out. This is the very first cow appreciation day ever at Chick-fil-A. And I'm, yeah, yeah, Cindy. I feel the same way when I see that picture. Anyway, um, we were in Atlanta. We had three kids. And I was just doing the chicken thing. I was a chicken salesman working in the marketing department at that point in time and working with the cow campaign and the Olympics coming to Atlanta and the cow plush toys and cow antenna toppers and cow this and cow that and cow vans and, <laughs> and uh, spent 30 years there making a career. But a very interesting thing happened in 1991 and I'm sure those of you that were alive and have memory of that time will know what I'm going to say because in 1991 a lot of interesting things happened and one of them, quite honestly for me, being a movie fan, was this, City Slickers. <laughs> Everybody remember City Slickers? Yeah. Those of you that, you know, for my students, City Slickers was a movie back in 1991, you should watch it some. Yeah. You're awesome just for being here. <laughs> I will remember. So. City Slickers, of course, is the story of Billy Crystal, and he's got a couple of buds, and they go to this dude ranch, and they're, you know, trying to find their way in life. You, you all remember the movie, right? And it was one of those things in the year 1991 that kind of touched the cultural zeitgeist of, of, you know, America when you saw this happening, and you saw this character who was looking and searching for meaning, and he came across this old Jack Palance character named Curly. You all remember that? Curly. And there's a scene where Billy Crystal and Curly are riding a horse and Curly figures out that Billy Crystal doesn't know what in the heck he wants to do with his life. And Curly tries to give him some very sound advice. Does anybody remember what it is? Just one thing. Just one thing. Focus your life, Billy Crystal, on just one thing. Focus your life on the thing that makes you happiest and do that and you'll find happiness, you'll find fulfillment. Do you all remember that now? You remember? And it was like, it wasn't a throwaway line. It was like a big deal. It was like you had me at hello. I mean, it was one of those kind of lines and people went, wow, that's profound. And as a young dad and as a chicken salesman, I am starting to think about, oh my gosh, what does this mean for me? In my life, I've done all these things. I've had all these things. I've tried all these things. And I've got Jack Palant sitting on a horse, <laughs> looking for all the world like he is Solomon the Wise, saying just one thing. And so I begin to struggle internally with what the heck am I doing? What am I? Who am I? What should I be focused on? And honestly, I will tell you that this conversation went on inside of me for years, for years. And maybe some of you feel that way. Maybe there's somebody in here that kind of goes, yeah, I understand what you're saying. I get it. Because it wasn't until about, actually about 10, 12 years ago that I realized that for me, Curly's wisdom didn't apply. 
didn't apply. I thought, what if I am not like everybody else? What if I am like the sheepdog here in the middle of it, and I just, I can't decide what I want to do, and I want to do too many things, and I love doing them all, and they all give me energy, and they all give me joy, and it's okay. And I'm not saying this is for everybody, and I'm not saying that the wisdom of Curly on the horse isn't something that you might not want to pursue with your life, but for me, it was different. And I really had to struggle with giving myself permission to be different and giving myself permission to do different things and to try different things and not be about one thing. And chicken was paying the bills and that was great. And I liked what I was doing and that wasn't the point. The point was that there were other parts of me that chicken was never gonna scratch. Ever, 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 ever. And one of those was my desire to one day tell a story. Just one day, I want to I wanna write something down. I want to tell a story. I want to, there to be a narrative. I want to have this and that and all these. And, and I want to say, I did that and point to the book on the shelf. And um, not just a story because I can write and that's fine, but I like to draw. So I wanted the story to be like a comic book because I'd drawn comic books when I was a kid and I always had an affinity to them, and I wanted to go back to them, and I will tell you, this is not something that chicken people understand. <laughs> I will tell you that straight up. They don't get it. Three-headed monster over here. Ah. And yet, that was really, really powerful for me to try to do that. Now, you can struggle with that, and then you can say, okay, I'm gonna do it, but it's always best to have some help. It's always best to find people like you, because I was convinced I wasn't the only sheepdog in the herd of sheep. And I have found these two guys. And this is Ed, and this is Jack. And I've known Ed and Jack for 20 years. We, we went to church together. We were in the same Sunday school class together. You know, we, we did life together. Our families grew up. Our kids were the same age. We just were together. We knew each other. And so one day I told Ed, and this was at Christmas party, uh, 2012. I told Ed, I said, I pulled him aside as he's walking out the door. I said, come here. I said, I want to do something. He said, what? He said, I want to write a book. I want to write a graphic novel. And I want you to help me. I don't want to do this alone. I said, is this interesting to you? Do you get me? And the reason I told Ed that is because I knew Ed got me. He wasn't going to think I was a three-headed monster. He said, I'm in. I mean, like that. I'm in. I'm in. I want to do something. And then in January, we talked to Jack. Same thing. I'm in. I want to do something different. I want to try something new. So these two gentlemen with me, I mean, we actually, we, we call ourselves the Lost Mountain Mechanicals. We created an LLC, Lost Mountain Mechanicals. You know, Lost Mountain, where we close, we're close to this place in Atlanta, northern Atlanta suburbs. It's called Lost Mountain. And theater! <laughs> Mechanicals. Um, working stiffs just trying to do something creative. <laughs> Probably going to do it badly, but we're going to try anyway. And we're sitting there, and we're talking about it, we're talking about it, and we decided that at some point in time, you just have to do it. Stop talking about it. You want to write a graphic novel, go write a graphic novel. And keeping in mind that none of us had any idea what we were doing. Any idea. We'd never written a, a graphic novel. I think Ed had toyed with writing a book. Um, I had some art experience, but I wasn't that good to do a whole graphic novel. But we just had to leave. We had to go. And we had to start. And so then we start asking ourselves the question, OK, we're going to do this. We're committed. So what do we want to write? What kind of graphic novel do we want to write? Because you saw all the comic books on the shelf. There's a lot. I mean, this is not like a, a small niche kind of a, of a creative experience. If you go into bookshops, there are aisles and aisles and aisles and rows and rows of these things. But we wanted to be different. We wanted to stand out and do something different. If we're going to do this, let's do this. Go home or go big. 
go, go big or go home. Yeah, yeah. Strike that, reverse it, right? You strike that, reverse it, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So um, we thought, okay, what are we drawn to? Well, the first thing we were drawn to was classic adventure. I mean, we, we grew up with comic books, yes, but we also grew up with Jules Verne. We grew up with, you know, um, H.G. Wells. We grew up with science fiction. We grew up with Tolkien. We liked adventure. So we were going to, whatever we did, we were going to have some element of adventure, some element of, of good guys and bad guys, you know? I mean, going back to some classic, classic formulas. We liked that. There, we kind of felt like there was enough dark, cynical characters. We wanted to go for something a little bit more classic. So we were drawn to that. Another thing we were drawn to was a particular age. And by age, I mean era. These are my grandparents. My grandfather, Peter Nedvedek, was an immigrant from Bohemia. My grandmother, Frances Krzyzan, that's how you say her name, Krzyzan, try that. Everybody out loud. Yeah. Um, from Moravia. They were married in uh, 1919. My grandfather fought in the First World War on the U.S. Cavalry to get his citizenship. Always been fascinated with that. Always fascinated with that time. And thought, why, don't there, why aren't there more like superheroes in that time? I mean, you think about superheroes. Okay, you've got Captain America, the first Avengers. But he's mid-1940s, right? And so that kind of starts that whole thing. Even, even, you know, you've got Superman a little bit before that. So you, Greg's listening because he's, he's dialed into, okay, wait a minute. Superman was in the 30s. So, so you had all that World War II stuff. But nobody was around, really, for, for this particular era. And we were fascinated with this era. We were fascinated with World War I. We were fascinated with what was going on in the world during that time. It was a time of intense change. It was a time of, of countries going away, new countries rising up. It was a time of, of weird politics and crazy things happening. And we thought, huh, this is a good place to do something different. And by the way, we wanted our heroes in our story to be the veterans of the war. And there are a lot of characters in our books, and, there, and many of them are historical, but our heroes are all original. And they are people from the war, soldiers and nurses who were damaged somehow, who come back to fight against the anarchists that were really trying to blow up the world. We were also drawn to a story of people working together. Um, I will just say at that point in time, we all kind of felt like everybody was picking sides. Everybody in the world was picking sides. And wouldn't it be great if we had a story where people were actually very different, but all linked and doing something good together? So we were drawn to this idea of, of being together, of working together. We were all history buffs. Some of my favorite professors in college were history professors. I had one professor that literally would stand up on his table and he would do sound effects for a particular battle. And then they're coming over there and, whoosh, and then they're coming. And I'm like going, oh my gosh, this is amazing what he's doing. So we were drawn to history. This is the bombing of Wall Street, 1920. An event that really happened. A group of anarchists took a, um, they took a horse truck, they filled it with shrapnel, and they parked it in front of the J.P. Morgan Bank and they blew it up and 38 people died. And the scarring on the building is still there. And so we were fans of history, but we were fans also of interesting facts, things that people didn't know about. And if you talk to people about this, most people don't know this happened. And a variety of other things. We found all kinds of really cool historic cues, blimps blowing up over Chicago that nobody had any idea. The flying squad creations in London, the first quick response, like SWAT team. All these things were, were real. They were being formed. So we started to scour all these weird facts and try to link them together in some kind of narrative. And we were having a blast doing it. One of the things that we were drawn to is this place. 
This is Jekyll Island Club Hotel. Jekyll Island is a real place. Most people think of Jekyll and they think of, you know, Mr. Hyde. But Jekyll Island is a real place. It's one of the Golden Islands on the coast of Georgia. And in the late 1800s, Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, Pulitzer, Carnegie, Morgan, all these big industrialists built this club. And you can, and it still exists. Fell into disrepair. You can go to this hotel and stay there. And you feel like you're living on, you know, in first class and on the Titanic or whatever. It's that appointed with all the wood and everything. And it's gorgeous. And this was in our backyard and most people didn't know about it. And we thought, because what, what is interesting in that time that's uniquely Georgia? Jekyll Island. But even most Georgians hadn't been there, and they didn't know about it. So we're finding all these things that people didn't know about. We're trying to bring knowledge and awareness to, hey, here's some cool stuff. Maybe you've never heard of it before. Another thing we were drawn to was we were drawn to the technology at the time. Oh, my gosh. If you think about that period of history with things happening with Edison and Tesla, we discovered a guy named Charles Proteus Steinmetz, who was a contemporary of Tesla and Edison, and he was this tall. And he was just this wizard with electricity. We were finding out what Henry Ford was doing, and we were finding out what Carnegie was doing with steel and all this other stuff, and we thought, this is a really cool technology time. So we're going to use all these things in our story, and we're going to put them together in such a way and stylize it with diesel punk. So for those of you that have no idea what diesel punk is, it's kind of like steampunk, but it's another 40, 50 years in advance. So real cool stylistic type of drawings. So we had this wonderful narrative of veterans who were rebuilt with technology to become action heroes who were fighting anarchists in a diesel punk world. Yay! <laughs> That's different. And we called it the Jekyll Island Chronicles. And we thought, OK, now we can actually start writing the book. Because we had to set up all this infrastructure first. And again, we're looking at each other and going, we, we, what do we do? What do we do? <laughs> we we kind of sort of know. And then we had this idea. And this was one of those big ideas that you kind of went, oh, that was good. Savannah College of Art and Design, of course, in Savannah, um, they had been doing work with us corporately, where we would, at Chick-fil-A at least, sponsor a class, like for um, uniform design, for example. So we'd go talk to their people that do fashion, and we'd sponsor the class, and the students would come in, and they'd take this whole credit, a semester, on trying to develop new uniforms. And stuff. It was kind of cool. And so I talked to them at SCAD, and I said, have you ever done anything like this for a private individual? We're interested in writing a graphic novel. We'd like to get sequential art students to help us visualize this thing. And they said, you know, we've never done that before. Would you be interested in doing it now? They said, yes. So we started a course in March of 2013. And this is how fast it went. We had that initial meeting at Christmas party, 2012. By March of 2013, we were a class in SCAD with 10 students who were these great artists that were helping us visualize this. We went there for the beginning of the class, for the midterm, and for the final, and they were showing us things that they were working on, and these kids were blowing us away. They were phenomenal. And their project was to create a pitch packet for us. The idea is, if we can get a pitch packet made, we can then take the pitch packet to a publisher or a production company, and then maybe somebody would be interested, and it would kind of put us over the, you know. So yeah, cool, pitch packet, score. And we took the pitch packet. And we found that there actually was a graphic novel comic book editor in our hometown, in our town of Marietta, Georgia. So we're, I'm looking through the information in the back of the pitch packet, and they said, here's editors and stuff that you can contact. And I'm looking at see this name, Chris Steros, Top Shelf Publishing, Marietta, Georgia. And it was one of those, bing! We called him. 
We took him to lunch on the Marietta Square at a place called Tycoon. Good Thai food. And we gave him the pitch packet. The next day, Chris Steros calls me. He said, if you finish this, we will publish it. Now, I'm here to tell you, I don't think this stuff happens just in general. <laughs> I don't think that's the way it works, but that was the way it worked for us. It's about connecting the dots. That's what we figured is everybody's got dots in their life. Everybody's got people that they know. Everybody's got things that they do. If we were to, able to be able to connect these, maybe we could make something out of this thing. And IDW Publishing is the fourth biggest publisher of comic books in the country. It goes Marvel, DC, Image, who does Walking Dead. I'm sure you've heard of Walking Dead. And then, ID, and then uh, IDW. And Top Shelf was bought by IDW. So we went from being with this small publisher to now we're with this behemoth. Again, I don't think that stuff is supposed to happen that way. But it did for us. All right, great. So we have an idea, we have a pitch packet, we have a publisher, and we don't have any money to do this. <laughs> because here, here's an idea, here's a reality. In a graphic novel, the difference between this and a regular book is every page is drawn. And not only drawn, but colored. And it is expensive to do this. So we were looking at each other going, OK, so who's paying for this? <laughs> Who, how are we going to do this? We had learned that there were enough people who were supporting us along our journey to be interested in it that would ask us, so how are you doing with that book idea? How do you? So we did a Kickstarter campaign. We decided we would raise money for the Jekyll Island Chronicles. We asked for a $25,000 goal. We got $33,536 to support us. I took this screenshot from a church parking lot on my way home from work one day because I knew the seconds were counting down. I stopped. I had the wherewithal to go, I'm getting a picture of this. And so we had all these, we had 188 people. Most of them were people we'd never known who looked at this and said, I want to support that. I like that idea. I like that yellow umbrella and the sea of black umbrellas. I want to do that. I want to support them. We had some big donors and we had a lot of little donors. And so we had a pool of money so we could start. So we took two of those students from our class and we engaged them as our artist and our colorist. The artist was living in Charlotte. The colorist was living in Las Vegas. They were both graduated. They both needed work, and we both were helping them to get started in their career. But that didn't help us actually write the story. <laughs> Again, that's a piece. I can't tell you how many days and hours we spent down in my basement working on script. You, yes, you have to have those, the uh, art, but you have to have the story. So we began in earnest writing story, writing story, writing story. And we would, now I know why the Beatles broke up. <laughs> I will just tell you, I get it. You have serious arm wrestling things going on when you've got three different people with three different ideas and who wins. And everybody has a really good opinion. So what do you do? And you have to just set some ground rules in advance that Look, we're friends, and whatever happens, even if we don't do this, we're going to stay friends. And check your egos, and let's just do what's best. And usually, two of us will vote one direction, and one sorry, sad sack will just <laughs> put his tail between his legs and walk out of the room. But we all, we've been working together this many years to create this series. We had to finish the story. We had to work on our characters. This is our band of characters. These are our heroes and a couple of our villains. The only person in, uh, the only two people, well, okay, we've got four real people here. Nikola Tesla, Steinmetz, Henry Ford, and Luigi Galliani. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. She's real too. That's Gabriella Antonini. She was an anarchist who was blowing things up. So we put them together. Everybody else is heroes. Those are villains. 
So you're coming up with this stuff. And then one day we'd finished it. It was a hundred and I'm trying to get because this is really impressive. I want to I want to just I want to share this number with you. 123 pages of script, 45 scenes, 165 illustrated pages. And it took us it took us about 18 months to do the story, and it took the artist about 18 months to finish the art. These are some pages from book one. This theater, oh, what a lovely war. It was a show that I was in at Wake Forest, a musical, one of the best things I've ever been in my life. And I remembered a scene of people in trenches singing to each other. And I tried to recapture the bleakness that I felt was on stage that day. I drew this and sketched it first, sent it to the artist, he illustrated it, colorist after that, that's the final page. So every single page has to be done and treated that way. And again, it's an expensive proposition. But one day, we had it. The books came in. They were supposed to come in in July, they came in in May, and I remember when Jack Lowe got his book, he said, my hands were shaking. He said, my hands were shaking. I just couldn't fathom that I, we had finished this. And I remember getting my book and my hands weren't shaking. I remember getting the book thinking, what have we done? <laughs> because it doesn't end there. All I could think about was what we had to do next. And we had to do a lot next, a lot. First, we had to do a book launch. Our Barnes & Noble was great for us. We had a neighborhood Barnes & Noble. My wife, Sue, made cupcakes. We had over 100 friends show up. We sold 100 copies of the book in a, like a two-hour period. And it was a great book launch. But that's just one thing. You have to do more than that. What we figured out from our publisher is they were counting us to do all the marketing. Yeah, we didn't. And he told us that up front. He said, the way book publishing works now at least with IDW, is we'll get you into Comic-Con, we'll get you into the channels, but you've got to do all the marketing yourself. Cha-ching, <laughs> cha-ching. <laughs> and I keep reminding my wife, I don't play golf. <laughs> so this is my golf club membership that we're spending. We were picked up on the cover of our, of our uh, daily paper, the Marietta Daily Journal. Since that time, we've been in you know, a variety of blogs, other publications, book two has come out. So we've got some of the normal press stuff covered. Hmm. So look at me. Do I look like a social media expert? The answer is no. And remembering what you remember from Jack and Ed, we are guys in our 50s, and we don't know what the heck we're doing with the world of the interweb. We don't know. So we had to learn how to do social media. We opened up a Facebook page. We started Instagram. We did all these other things. We had to build a website. Again, we don't know what we're doing. Have you all got that <laughs> by now? We don't know what we're doing. We're just trying stuff because we think that we have to. We just have to. None of us want to die going, oh, I wish. And so we actually became pretty good at doing some of this stuff. Now we pay somebody to do it for us. And she's wonderful and she's much younger than we are and she's on it. And then of course, there's Comic-Con. So when the publisher tells you we can get you into Comic-Con, we lit up, we're like, oh really? That sounds like fun. <laughs> the book debuted in July of 2016 at Comic-Con in San Diego. 130,000 fans cramming into the San Diego Convention Center. It is madness. It is raving fans 2.0. It is craziness, crazy town. 
and you're in a convention center and you, you're, like, you're walking like this because there's so many people. I've been there before as just a person walking through. I've never been there before as a creator. And so we had to actually prepare for Comic-Con. This was us, all five of us, our, our illustrator, Moses, our colorist, S.J. Nestor. I'm sorry, Moses Nestor, S.J. Miller. We're at Comic-Con, and one of the things I want to make sure you get out of this is that people help you when you're trying to do something real crazy. They, they help you. Your friends help you. Let me tell you about some friends I have. These are friends from Legacy Effects. They're an effects, special effects company in LA. I grew up wanting to do special effects when I was a kid, just art, draw, special effects. This is Alan Scott. I met Alan Scott one day when I was trying to get a Chick-fil-A cow costume <laughs> made into an animatronic cow costume. Ears move, eyes blink, choose its cut. He built one for me on spec. So I've known this guy for a while. When he found out, now this, let me tell you what they do. They build Iron Man for Marvel movies. Um, the machines in Avatar. The Jurassic Park dinosaurs. I mean, these folks aren't fooling around. The creature from Shape of Water. Legacy effects. So Alan Scott, wearing, wearing, probably wearing my shirt, says, I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to build you legs for the, one of your characters. So he builds legs that put my son Alex eight feet tall, high up in the air. So this is our main character, the one who died, or not died, but who got his legs blown off in the trenches in World War I. He gets refitted with new metal legs from Andrew Carnegie that extend him, that allow him to jump over swimming pools, that in essence make him a superhero. And these metal legs, are built by the guys that build Iron Man. It's good to have friends that will help you. And, it's, and you shouldn't feel bad when you ask them for stuff because they want to help you. And many of them wish they could do the same thing. We actually, we were given an award from the state of Georgia, or the, the book, um, the Center for the Book in Georgia, awarded Jekyll Island Chronicles as one of the top 10 books every young Georgian should read for the year 2017. Again, I don't know how this stuff happens, but we're very fortunate to continue to have something to talk about. And then you find people, other people who are friends of yours that you didn't even know you had as friends of yours. Jonathan Mayberry is best-selling horror author. And now he's a fan of the Jekyll Island Chronicles. And so they write reviews and they do posts and we get pull quotes and we get all this stuff. And it's just building and it's building and it's moving and it's moving. And we're just riding the train. Now we have two books. They're up here. Book one and book two. Book two was released last year at Comic-Con, New York. And we are working on book three. Because we think that there's something special about a trilogy. <laughs> Ask J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, we started with an idea for ten books. The story of Jekyll Island is such that all these very wealthy people on this island had all these very big houses. And in the early 1940s, they were, there was a call made by the Secretary of War to Jekyll, saying, German U-boat off the coast. Get off the island. They left everything. Their houses were still there. Their stuff is still there. You can walk into Rockefeller's home, and it says if he was still living there. And it's preserved in time. So we thought, that's a great natural ending for this. 1942. Yeah, we're only right now in book two in like 1923. So the idea of ten more, or you know, eight more books is daunting. We're going to settle for a trilogy, and we're going to see what happens. Which brings me back to this guy. Again, I'm not saying that this doesn't work for you. I'm saying it didn't work for me. And I wished 
I had known that about myself way early in life. I wished I'd given myself permission to go chase different things way early in life. And if there's anybody that is looking to chase something or wondering if it's okay, um, you'd be in very good company. Uh, Patty LaBelle sells food. She makes like sweet potato pies. And so Elton John, of course, is an award-winning photographer. I mean, we all know them for their day jobs, but they've got all these, uh, Anthony Hopkins has an art gallery in Maui and sells his paintings. Steve Martin, of course, awesome screenwriter, um, you know, play author, and does great with banjo. <laughs> classic, classic. Um, Erica Badu is, it, she's into like helping moms deliver babies. Reese Witherspoon. She sells an awful lot of stuff. An awful lot of stuff. Purses, shoes. So the point is, I decided it was okay for me to have many me's. To, to be a lot of different things. And I think if you make that decision for you and you decide to do this, regardless of whether you succeed or fail, it doesn't matter. It's not what the point is. The point is you have to do it. You just have to do it. I can't tell you over the years how many people have come up to me and said, wow, I'm so proud of you. I can't tell you the number of people that have come up to me and said, I wish I had. Dot, dot, dot. If there's something that you wish you had, feel the permission to jump. Because those of us that are watching you will be cheering you on. And that's how a deke with no experience <laughs> in creating graphic novels became somebody who now has two on a All right, questions. <laughs> Anybody have any questions or thoughts? Yes, Ron. I'm curious about the artistic process that you have under your artistic background. Did you sketch a bunch of the pages and send them to your illustrator and colorist? Or yeah. did you know, like, yeah, yeah. did you say, I vaguely want it to look like this? But yes, I, make it like I did I actually do that. Um, yeah. with, at home, I have three binders, and they're all about this big. And they're all book one. Because I have, for every page, I have my original sketch, and then I have what they came back with, and then I have the ink, and then I have the color, and then I have the sound effect added on, to, on top of it. So each one of those pages is about six pages. That's right. I stopped doing that with book two. <laughs> but yes, I continue to do that. Now, here's, here's wonderful things about technology, is now what I do is I have an app on my iPad called Strip Designer. And I take the script, the script, and I go into Strip Designer, and I determine how many panels I want it to be, and I can create it, and I drop in reference photos. So I'm, we're watching Game of Thrones, and Sue's over there doing cross-stitch, and, and she's looking at me, and I'm scrolling through images on Google search. Because I need an image of a weird Italian mountain town. And so I'm just scrolling and scrolling. I find one, I drop it into Strip Designer. So I have really, really, really tight comps now. And I send them, put them in Dropbox, apprentice over in London, grabs them out of Dropbox, he re-swizzles them because he's the expert, I'm not. He changes something, something goes, this is great. Inks them, and then Sarah colors them and adds all the sound effects. So we've gotten better, yeah. but I still do all the layouts yeah. because one, it makes it easier for the artists so they don't have to do all that reference work, and two, because I like doing it. I just, it, sorry, I like doing it. All right, good question. Any others? Yes? Oh gosh, my personal definition of art. 
Um, that, I, I guess we're getting philosophical today. Uh, for me, when I, and I have struggled with this because there are things that I think my dad would not have called art. You know, he, he painted portraits and he was a realist. And if I had taken him over to the Tate Gallery ever, he would have walked out going, what is this nonsense? So I think that it's probably different for everybody. But for me, art um, is something that is a creative output that challenges you with a message. And it can be a message that uplifts you, or it can be a message that just totally gets in your face and goes, nope. But it communicates something. It can communicate beauty, it can communicate horror. But it's in essence a creative process that speaks. So photography, theater, music, any of those things. That's what it is to me. Sorry. All right, I'm probably way off and way wrong, but that's, <laughs> yeah, any other questions? Um, not really, no. It, it, it took my wife a long time to just read the second book. First book's like everybody, ah, look at the book. Second book's like, eh. We, we took a road trip and she took the book with us and she read it on the road trip. And then she's like, oh, that's pretty good. Thanks, honey. Glad you're so involved. Um, but no, not really. We, the, the, even the editor. Uh, the way that we did the first book and the reason it took so long is he needed to see the script and approve the script before we even started drawing. And we asked him about that for book two. We said, do, do we need to show you that because we don't want to get in trouble and do... He said, you are now authors of a graphic novel. I trust you. And so, I, to be honest, I'm not even sure he's read it. <laughs> because he got all this other stuff. So no, not really. We push back on ourselves more than anything. Yeah, it's, it's very, very good. I was talking to him today. So book three is 2012. I'm sorry, 2021. We were shooting for 2020. We're not, we're not going to, we're going to take our time. Going to take our time. Yes? I'm asking another question. So who are your audiences? Because, you know, I mean, I have a 12-year-old and, and my husband's a book of um, like comic book geek. But do you see, like, when you go and you're out there at book signing and you're hearing about, are you, or is it the teenagers, is it the adults, is it male, female? Like, it's, it's weird because, because it's so many different people. Like no. Books, no. I think they really aren't. They're not. I mean, they're, they're well, they were, they were, you know, that Georgia Center for the Book yeah. thing. The deal with graphic novels for them is that they automatically go into the category of four children. Right. Young adult. Like Young, it, and it's not what it is. Yeah. Um, the beginning of interest is probably middle school. Because we'll see, if we're at Comic-Con, we'll see grown men and their teenage daughter both getting books and both lighting up over different things and both have different reasons for doing it. So it's not one particular audience. Right now it's being um, considered for you know, production for TV and film, which is great. But part of the scenario is, who's your audience? You know. Who's your audience? Are you, are you dr trying to do this or are you trying to do that? I, and it's probably wrong for me to say it's more than one audience, but I think it is more than one audience. You can fall in love with it because you're in the history area. You can fall in love with it because you're a diesel punk. So I, we don't have a defined, clear audience on it's only these folks. Other questions? Anybody else? Yes, Rogan. Yes, sir, down in front. The, the sharp dressed gentleman on the front row. Since, since we took a philosophical turn earlier, yeah. uh, I will take personal liberty of a long time. Right? And push back on your existential self definition. Do you powerfully resist the idea of just one thing? I mean, you strive for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
mm. connect the dots. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it works with the step wire, but I connect the dots. Yeah. That was just awkward. Yeah. Uh, for especially the young people here who may be wondering themselves, where is the connection? Interesting. Connect those dots. Yeah. That was awkward. No. I thank you for offering that. <laughs> give, that'll give me something to chew on while I'm having pot roast tonight. I, I think what you're talking about is interesting because I do find that um, one of the things I have tended to do well in my life is to connect the dots. Um, which dots? Whose dots? When? But I also see other people that don't. They're very happy not to connect dots. Um, I've been studying or thinking a lot about the topic of curiosity recently, over the last year. I'd love to do a, teach a class on curiosity at some point in time. And um, I think curiosity is a muscle that people exercise differently. For example, my wife is a, a, an accountant by trade. That's what she does. So when she's curious, she's looking for clarity because the dots she's connecting are an equation usually. Or we'll be sitting there watching something and she'll go, who is that? I mean, like we're in the middle of a movie, and she's, where have I seen it before? And, and if we weren't sitting in a movie, she'd pull out her phone, and until she connects that dot, she, you, you can't talk to her. She's got to do that. Um, I tend to think, like, I don't care who that is. It doesn't matter. Watch the movie. Um, but I, so I, I exercise that curiosity differently. And for me, it's, I connect it to different things. Okay, I know this. So what? What does that influence over here? And what does that influence over there? So I, th you know, I think everybody does that differently, probably. Yeah. OK. Anybody else want to follow up with a question more profound than that? Because <laughs> you got a lot of room, I'm telling you. You set a pretty low bar. Anybody? Well, I want to thank you all for being here and being a part of this. Um, I hope you get a chance. If you don't buy a book, just get a chance to read the book sometime. Find it. Give it to somebody that you think will enjoy. An alternate history anarchist versus action heroes told in a diesel punk styling. And, uh, and if not, that's okay. There's always jobs. So thanks. Thanks for being here.